Good evening. For this presentation, I will be talking about national anthems in former Soviet republics as a type of invented tradition, um, as defined by Eric Hobsbawm. So when I looked at this definition, anthems is uh, one of the first places where my mind went. Uh, they are very symbolic in nature. They often include or refer to values, uh, and they try to establish a continuity with the past, whether that's in the lyrics themselves or where the song, the origins of the song. Another thing I would like to consider is the purpose of an anthem. Um, and Hobsbawm had some useful insights about this as well. He said that there are three overlapping general types of invented tradition. They can be so they can be intended to promote social cohesion, legitimize institutions or authorities, or else pass on values, beliefs, behavioral norms, etc., within a community, within a society. Um, so I see a lot of these factors at play in anthems. So let's dive right in. The first anthem we'll be looking at is Kazakhstan. The original version of the anthem of Kazakhstan was composed in the 1950s as part of the Virgin Lands campaign. This was a massive development project in the Khrushchev era to turn northern Kazakhstan, the steppe region, into a breadbasket for the Soviet Union. Um, there were waves upon waves of uh, people moving into Kazakhstan, especially from Ukraine and Russia. So it changed the demographics there. Uh, it uh, contributed to Kazakhs becoming a minority in their own historic homeland. Um, and it also changed Kazakhstan's position uh, in its region, uh, its relationships with its neighbors and its position within the Soviet Union. So you see here images uh, pulled from the landscape, sky of the golden sun, step of the golden seed. Uh, sky and step, I would say, are, are uh, images that are regularly drawn on to evoke kind of national feelings of pride, especially step being a, a nomadic people of the step. After independence, um, they for a while kept the tune of their Soviet era uh, anthem. And then finally in 2006, uh, this song was pulled up. It was, um, the lyrics were changed a little bit and the uh, first president of Kazakhstan, Nostatan Nazarbayev, actually contributed a little bit, or at least so the legend goes. Um, and it became the, the anthem. So you see here, from antiquity, we say uh, a stress placed on Kazakh, the Kazakh national identity being something very ancient, uh, the Kazakh people are strong, etc. Um, this is from the official site of the president of Kazakhstan, um, really just uh, emphasizing what, what we already know, that uh, an anthem is a symbol, it helps promote social political consolidation uh, and ethnic cultural identification of citizens. But I thought it was interesting they put it in this way. Turning our attention now to Ukraine, there's an immediate shift in focus and tone in the lyrics. Ukraine's glory, Ukraine's freedom. So it's all about freedom and autonomy. We will be the only masters in our dear home. And the rest of the anthem goes on in this style. Um, this was originally a poem that was written by Pavel Chubinsky in 1862. He was probably inspired by the Polish uh, anthem of the time. There were some similarities that have been noted. Uh, it very quickly became popular, and just a few years later, Mikhailo Rybitsky composed a melody to go along with it. They were put together and performed uh, as a song for the first time in 1865. Uh, Rabitsky was actually a priest at the Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, I'll come back to that on the next slide. Um, in Soviet times, there was a different uh, anthem, of course, but in 1992, after independence, the melody was reinstated. Then, similar to the case with Kazakhstan, uh, the lyrics were modified and then finally confirmed in 2003. Just in time for the Orange Revolution, um, when the song became very popular and was performed by protesters, similarly in 2013 during the Euromaidan. So this quote um, from a composer, Ukrainian composer, stood out to me. He talks about uh, Rybitsky, who is a church composer, he says. 
and this patriotic song he created as a church composer. This chant is a hallelujah. No other anthem has this. He goes on to explain that uh, the Ukrainian anthem is unique because it's both a sort of has this liturgical um, melody to it, uh, but then also is a source of great national pride. Next up, we're in Latvia. And again, I'll start with looking at the lyrics. So these are uh, simpler compared to the last two, but the significance here is that this is the first time that a composer used the word Latvia in a song. So the composer was Carlos Baumanis. Uh, he wrote this song, the lyrics and the music in 1873. So this is around the time that uh, Hobsbawm talked about where there was a real boom in tradition inventions. Uh, it was performed at the Latvian first song festival. And these go on to this day uh, here in the picture. Um, these are a big cultural tradition uh, in the Baltic states. Um, it became an anthem. Well, it was sung when Latvia became independent in 1918, and two years later it became their first anthem. Uh, then the song was banned completely during the Soviet years um, and finally reinstated in 1990. You'll notice that's actually before they were fully independent from the Soviet Union, so they were a little preemptive in that. Uh, this quote from the website of the president of Latvia really cements its uh, significance um, in the development of national consciousness. Um, I was strongly reminded of Benedict Anderson and imagined communities here with talking about Latvia in quotation marks as a concept that took shape in the minds of writers and activists uh, and then trickling down to most Latvians, to most people who at that point weren't even dreaming of a sovereign state. So um, later he talks about the, the significance of the choice to use the word Latvia um, by this composer was uh, really standing up to uh, the Tsarist Russian Empire. And actually for the first um, few decades of this song's existence, uh, they weren't allowed to say Latvia. They were, they, the word was changed to Baltics. So very interesting there. The last anthem that I'm excited to talk about today is uh, the anthem of Moldova, because it's all about language. This was originally a treasure, or sorry, originally a poem. Um, it says, our language is a treasure uh, that surges from the deep shadows of the past. So also drawing on Moldova as this very ancient, real thing, um, that something that awoke, we see that, that word used that's often used in nationalist literature. This one was made an anthem in 1995, uh, and here the law uh, that, that instated it as the anthem said that uh, all citizens must have a profound esteem for the state anthem of the Republic of Moldova, and it's their patriotic duty. Um, so I was fascinated looking at these cases, and I'm sure there are many more. Um, I think there's a lot to be uh, uncovered about how people view themselves, how people define their nation uh, in these songs. Thank you very much.